Hi there, Lindsay here, the Frugal Crafter. This is just going to be a, oh, kind of fun demo. Um, I've got my M-Gram palette out. I also have my set of, my DIY set of granulating colors, which I'm going to give a nice spray to so they can wake up a little bit. And what we're going to do here is basically paint some rocks and a little landscape. And the the thing that I'm really curious about is whether or not this paper is still good. So what I did the other day, it was actually last night, I was just practicing my sketchbook making um, because I'm going to be teaching a workshop where I'm going to be teaching, like, making a sketchbook. So um, I just, you know, practicing. And I had a bunch of papers that I found in a filing cabinet that I had roughly ripped down. And I thought, well, I'll just make sketchbooks out of those so I can free some, space, free some space up in the filing cabinet. And then it's like, you know, I'm wondering if this paper is still good because it's been in my basement for a long time. So I thought I would just do a little painting on it and we will see. We will see if it's if it's any good or not. I got some mineral violet there that might be nice to use. I'm going to start off just by sketching and I'm going to use a Graphitin pencil, which is a pencil that is, um, it is got color in it and also has graphite in it, water soluble graphite. And I'm not going to go exactly by a reference photo, but um, I did see one with a really interesting rock in it. And it doesn't have, it's kind of, it's a, it's for one, it's a vertical photo, so it's not exactly what I wanted. But I'm like, you know, this is enough for me to go on. This paper might not even work out. This paper might have like bad sizing in it. So we're going to see. Um, so I store I store my full sheets of paper under my bed um, in a, you know, climate controlled room because, you know, full sheets of paper are expensive, especially like my Arches and my Fabriano and um, any of my cotton watercolor paper that are in the full sheets. And so, um, so they're up there, but then I like to have paper that I can just have in smaller sizes to work with. So I will go through, I'll tear up uh, or tear down rather a sheet of most everything. I'm not even bothering to tape this down. Uh, so I will tear down a sheet of 22 inches by 30 inch paper into, sometimes I'll tear it into quarters, sometimes I'll tear it into eighths, sometimes I'll tear it into random shapes. And that's what I had done um, oh back a while ago and I still had some left. And so while I've been making all these sketchbooks just to, you know, make sure I've got the muscle memory down and I don't totally freeze <laughs> when I'm teaching at the art retreat that I'm doing in May, um, I thought, well, instead of like tearing down more paper, why don't I use up what I have since I do have some different um, some different papers there. So that's what I that's what I did with that sketchbook. I have it's like half Fabriano Uno, which is I guess what they used to call the I think now it's rebranded to Artistico, but I think it's about the same paper. And I like to use rough papers for landscapes anyway. Uh, let's do a horizon line. I'm gonna use my T square because I hey you know what we have tools in this life to help us. So we might as well use them, right, uh, on this edge of the paper that's probably, I'm like, you know what, I'm thinking, you know, I'm going to bring it up higher, but maybe I'll put another rock in there. Well, how high do I want to go? Do I want to do rule of thirds? Rule of thirds is a good idea. Let's do, let's do roughly a third of the way down the paper. We'll do this horizon line. The reason I'm using this pencil is because it will, um, it will dissolve. So we have that breaking that tangent, which will look nice. I could even bring that up higher over there if I wanted to. We'll put a rolling field here. And then we'll have some trees, various layers of trees that'll be kind of blurry. You don't have to worry about them too much. I'm putting too much in there because I don't want to have a bunch of dirt in the sky. Um, I'll have some sandy, some sandy sand over here. I think I kind of do want a pile, the pile of rocks maybe to go up over the break the horizon here too. Why not? That, I I think that looks kind of nice. Maybe a carn or something. You know when they stack the rocks up and then you've got like a, I don't know. I like it. I think it's fine. Besides, like I said, we're just we're just gonna play with this. So um, I think with landscape stuff, especially with rocks, it's nice to use some granulating colors. And this was my DIY palette. I did a whole blog post about this. If you're curious, uh, basically, 
Some colors are sedimentary. They will tend to sit on top of the paper, split apart, and give you interesting textures. These are all single pigment colors that do that, and they were ones I just had anyway. Um, and before I got any of the super granulating colors, which um, I got some sent to me, shared with me from friends. It was really nice. My friend Rosie sent me a bunch of hers. But before I got those, I wanted to go through and see what I had. And uh, that's a really good idea. If you're ever wanting to try on a trend, like a granulating, granulating watercolor, see what you have first. If anything you have will granulate. And then chances are you'll be able to, you know, you'll be able to try on the trend enough that you won't have to go and necessarily, you know, buy all the things. I'm just going to wet the sky area. You know what I'm going to do actually? I'm going to wet the whole back of the paper because I don't want this to buckle and I did not, um, I did not tape it down. So that's a great, that's a great way to keep your paper from buckling. I got a bit of lint there. That's gross. <laughs> oh, what are you going to do, right? I got pets. I got pets and not a very good housekeeper. <laughs> I will slap that right down. Hopefully that's enough. Ah, come on you. Let's give that a little bit more water on the back. I'm not too worried about my about my sketch getting messed up. There we go. Generally, I would just go ahead and wet the whole front. Maybe I should just do that. Don't really want to wet the. Um, don't really want to wet the rocks. No, I think it's going to come down. I think it's going to be fine. All right. So for the sky, I think I would like to do a cerulean. A cerulean blue. That's a lovely blue that tends to. Um, that tends to granulate. I want to do any. Um, shadowy clouds. I can add a little bit of potter's pink into that and it'll be very soft, a very soft. Boy, I just realized this chair is very squeaky. I'm not seeing any problems with the sizing yet, so that's good. Um, then I'm going to do some far away trees. I think I'll just go around. I'm kind of liking that Potter's Pink. I'm not sure what brand that is. I think I want to do a little bit of Potter's Pink in here. It's almost like um, I don't know. Deciduous trees that have in this like early spring. They haven't really popped yet. They're still kind of gray. And you getting a little bit of uh, I feel like I'd like to do a little bit Ooh, that cerulean's nicer. Maybe that wasn't cerulean. What was that? I didn't have it written down. Um, it's a cerulean, but it must be a different brand. Um, cause I'm working from my M. Graham palette. I like to do purples off into the distance. I'm just playing here. Well, I think the sizing is just fine in this. So I was a little concerned because um, this paper I found in, uh, I was looking for, for file folders. I needed some file folders. And um, I had I didn't have any. I was really surprised. And I'm like, oh, maybe I have some in the filing cabinet. And in the filing cabinet, I found all of these watercolor papers that I forgot I tore down. This was like way back in the day I tore these down. I'm going to take some sap green, some M. Graham sap green. I'm actually going to move the um, move my granulating palette out so I have some more area on my big, my big palette. I typically don't use uh, M Grams are my favorite watercolors, but I typically don't use them on YouTube just because the palette they're in is so big. Um, this is the Jones. I'll show you really quick. This is the Jones palette. And you can see it's really big, but I love that mixing area. And if I didn't do YouTube and I wasn't filming, um, I would, I would be using that. I use the smaller tins because it's just easier to fit on screen so you can see where I'm mixing and stuff. I'm going to cat hair or something there. I don't like to go in with my fingernails because I can scratch the paper really easily. 
Oh my goodness. You just gotta urge him over to the edge. Well, I have to say that I think the sizing on this paper is pretty good. Oh my, maybe I can just get it now that it's really close to the edge. Huh, there we go. <laughs> that little bugger wants to be part of my painting. Oh, and you know what? I think we'll use some of this nickel titanate yellow. That's a color you don't see around too much, especially in watercolors anymore. And this was actually a Cotman color. And sometimes you'll hear me wax nostalgic about Cotman's old watercolors because um, I painted so much with Cotman when I was younger and when I was teaching, um, teaching kids and teaching in the senior center. And I, it has a spot in my heart. It has a spot in my heart. And, the, but their paints were different. Um, and I'm not saying their paints are bad now. I don't think they are. They're, and they're an affordable choice for sure. Um, but they definitely are different. They don't like, you won't find nickel in their paints anymore. You won't find, um, and I'm sure a lot of people are happy about that. You won't find, um, let me take a little bit of that potter's pink in there too. You won't find cadmiums or cobalts. Uh, maybe they did it for toxicity reasons, but I'm a little cynical. I think they did it to make them cheaper. Use some of this purple down here. A lot of times when I'm doing like a background, I'm going to be more like, um, even a little bit brighter, brighter of a pink. Uh, that's really bright. It's probably a little too bright. Let's tone it down with some other stuff on the palette. Um, I Sorry, I lost my train of thought. These are pretty colors and I'm enjoying this paper. I don't know why I don't paint with rough paper more often. I do enjoy it. I think it's probably because I don't do landscapes heck of a lot. But that little sketchbook that I made is going to be really nice for uh, for landscapes this summer, I think. I tend to not be too excited about doing landscapes uh, in, my, in the studio from photos. But I love to go out in the summer. I am a, a real fan of summer, so getting out in the nice weather... Painting on location, going out with friends, meeting up with friends, and going out to paint somewhere. It's so nice. I highly recommend. Um, I highly recommend it if you can find a painting group to join, to get, you know, inspired by. I really, really think it's a wonderful thing. Hmm, I'm liking those colors. I'm going to get a little more sap green. This is the older M. Graham Sap Green. Um, they have changed the formula, and I don't think it's as vibrant and as luminous as it used to be. I do have several, I have, I have like, how many, two or three tubes of it, and I'm, some is the new and some is the old. I did a video where I compared them, uh, and there was, there was a difference. It's not as, it's not as luminous. There's a beautiful green by Sennelier. Their there. Olive green is, is very luminous. It's, a lot of olive greens can be, greens can be a little drab. But Sennelier's is very luminous. It's very pretty. I like a cotton paper. Uh, even in the winter with my radiator running in here, which can dry stuff out pretty well, I feel that I get a nice, um, I still get a nice, like, absorbency and it holds its color for a good long time. Um, I don't know if I want to bring in a yellow that's more vibrant than this nickel titanate just because I've, that's what I've been using and I don't really have call for more yellow so I'm thinking I might just stick with this because uh, for, for the sake of harmony in my painting. Sometimes I get very like I don't know what the word is. Maybe it's just too... I don't consider myself a perfectionist, so I don't know if that's the right word, but sometimes I'll just kind of feel a little too like, oh, I've got to do this and it's got to be great and it's got to be perfect. Um, maybe I'm using a product that I've like really built up into my head that it's awesome and i got to save it for the best. Or maybe um, I need to get something made for YouTube because I haven't posted a certain type of video in a while and I'm feeling like people are going to be upset if I don't have... Um, 
something new and great to share. And then it's like, ah, I, can't, I get myself so freaked out. I can't, like, I can't do anything. So in cases like that, I think it's really nice to maybe grab something that's not your favorite and just play with it. This paint here is a color called Gothite. And it's by Daniel Smith. And it's the same pigment as you would find in... Um, in... Uh, yellow ochre, but it's I know, it's milled differently or heated differently. Anyway, it um, it has granulating properties. I don't know if I'm in a wet enough situation here for it to really show that, but I just wanted to use that for the sand here on the on the shore. Not that you really see t much texture at that distance, but so far so good with the um, with this with this paper holding up. I think. Um, all right, so I've got some water that I want to paint in there, but it's going to bleed if I if I do that, I think, unless I leave a little gap, which maybe I'll do. Maybe I'll just leave a little gap. Um, I'm going to go stick with a cerulean. I like the cerulean I have in my M. Graham palette. I don't know what the other cerulean, what brand that is. I think it might be Renaissance, maybe, because I got a lot of my colors. A lot of the colors in that are Renaissance. We're definitely going to look at how bold that is. We're going to need, we're going to need a lot more water in there. I think I'll just try to keep a, a sliver, a little gap of dry paper. And that will also give us a little sparkle. I'm actually, the other thing is, uh, I didn't mention, um, I don't think I mentioned, uh, I'm doing this right now because I'm actually in the middle of a project where I'm waiting for, uh, I'm waiting for a canvas to dry. I've got, I'm doing these two tall canvases for over my mantle and I'm like, well, I'll turn that into a critique club project while I'm at it because it's going to paint magnolias. I'll have a time lapse up for YouTube as well. Uh, but anyway, I'm like, well, I might as well just, uh, I'm just going to wet this because I want to get that. I, I do want to see the texture. Here I go. I'm going overboard with the granulation again. I know it should be a, like a sprinkle on top and not the main course, but I don't know what it is. I just can't help myself. Um, plus I want to see if this, how this paper is doing. Um, yeah, so it's going to be magnolias, and I did, did the background, and that's drying, so both of those canvases are sitting on an easel drying on the other side of my my filming room, and it's just kind of like a slip-slap, scrapey paint background, which actually I think looks pretty cool. And yeah, so that's drying, and I'm like, well, I don't want to fuss with it before it's fully dry, because I want to be able to draw on top of it. And, um, and be able to, uh, words, <laughs> I want to draw on top of it and be able to, uh, like if I make a mistake, be able to wipe it off with like a wet rag or a, or something so that I'm not, I don't have to be too worried about it. Because I'm not gonna, I don't think I'll do a pattern for that. I think I'm just gonna sketch right on there. I the I wanted this kind of dappled light effect, so I'm hoping that when I hang it on the wall, it's gonna look like I have windows and there's a big magnolia tree outside. That's kind of my goal, or at least kind of that impression, because um, the canvases are like a foot by two feet, and I just think they, if I do them on either side of this big mirror, I have room until it'll give it that kind of um, that kind of look. That is really, it's almost like a little too bright for the color of the sky. I think I want to get some of those colors from the background in there too, especially that really pretty purple that we did with the cerulean blue and the potter's pink and the um, and the quinacridone. I'm going to just pull some of that in there too. I think that would look nice. I want to do it while it's still wet so I get a little bit of blending. I'm just gonna I'm just kind of tapping in colors. There isn't really reflection. This the water's a little choppy, so I can't really see the reflection, but I'm just gonna wing it. I'm gonna do a little bit of the uh, sap green as well. 
Oh, I forgot how much I enjoyed this palette. This is turning into more of like a lakey scene. As we go, as we're getting reflections. That's fine with me. I have a very loose reference photo. But it's not it's the wrong orientation and it's you know not exactly what I want. Oh, I've got a new computer too. I'm trying not to splash paint on it, but <laughs> we'll see how that goes. I don't know. I, this uh, the nickel titanium is also a little bit opaque, so I want to be careful not to get too muddy. And most of your granulators will have a bit of opacity to them as well, so. Just something to keep in mind. Uh, I like to have a credit card scraper when I'm going to be doing rocks, so I'm going to want to make sure that I've got one of those handy. I always have handy in my in my little drawer that's right next to right next to the table. And I also kind of want to use this brush here. This is a Reservoir Quill that I purchased. I think I paid about twenty twenty two dollars for it. It's the um, the Mimic brush, which is a combination of faux sable and faux squirrel. So the, the stiffer bristles are in the middle, and then the more absorbent bristles are on the outside. So hopefully that should give us some really nice um, some really nice details. So I'm just going to go ahead and use uh, this uh, Mars. Mars Black. I'm just going to start sketching in some of the um, cracks and fissures in the rock. I could also you could also use like a type of ink that I think that would look nice too and I'll probably go in and put some on back afterwards because I'm gonna have to be careful about the edges I can't go in and mess around in those edge areas too much without it uh, without it messing up but the thing you can see how effortless it is to get these rocky textures with a with a kind I don't want to say unwieldy but it is kind of a um, the reason it is like this is so that you can theoretically go further with um, with a load of of paint. I don't know if that's necessarily what I've experienced with this brush, but I definitely need to use it more. I've had it for probably nine months, and I've got to say it has not like I'm not sold on it yet. Um, and it could just be the brand that I bought. Maybe I didn't get. I mean, I didn't get the most expensive brand. I didn't want a real uh, animal for a brush because I think there's enough really good really good faux fur brushes that I don't want to I don't want to you know buy animal brushes I think I probably should have got a smaller size because I think this bigger one is kind of limited because the tip of that and the tip already kind of has a little bit of a hook on it which I don't think it's supposed to have I don't know I guess this has been not a very awesome purchase in my opinion but I haven't really I don't feel like I've really gotten to know the brush well enough to say that for sure all right I want to do I want to make this kind of sandy like I said I do have a reference photo I'm looking at but the reference photo is not um I'm not going for for it 100 percent and so the sand is very gray in the reference photo but I think I want to take some of that gothite that I used further further in the background because it's a warmer color I think if I add that to the sand, maybe with some Potter's Pink, um, I'll get the beautiful sandy texture and it, the warmth of color will help bring it um, bring it forward. So I'll take some of the Gothite. I'm using the dagger brush from my uh, Craft Ammo set, which is no longer available, but you could use any dagger brush you have. I do not plan on re-releasing those. Um, so, you know, if you have them, use them. If you don't, then you know, look through your stuff. You could also use a round or a flat. It really doesn't matter. Um, but I do find that if you have a variety of brushes and you're finding that you're getting kind of samey with your um, 
with your work if you if you if you switch brushes then that will often just kind of help you get a little bit more variety you know because you'll just start making some different marks you'll start holding it differently like I hold a, a dagger or a flat brush differently than I hold a round brush so it just helps you helps you get some some more variety without without too much fuss I should say now I take some of this cerulean the first cerulean I used it wasn't quite as bold and take some of that uh, Mars black which is a heavily granulating black I'm gonna add some of that in there too give us a little wet sand shadow work this real wet so that you will pick up some of that texture and granulation and maybe even throw a little bit of green in there for some for some algae I think I'll do I'll do the sap green but I'm gonna mix in some of the nickel titanate yellow I'm gonna mix in some of these cerulean actually let's do those two colors first and see that's very milky and add some sap to it and do maybe a little bit of yeah we'll see how that dries you know we can always add more to it if we need to all right I'm gonna switch over to a one inch flat again for my craft ammo set a one inch or three quarter inch flat is a very useful brush to have, especially if you like to paint rocks because it forces you to be more random. I'm gonna grab, um, I'm gonna grab some of that lighter cerulean blue. I'm gonna grab some of the Mars black. Put some water in there. Throw in some chunky shapes here and there. I'm gonna grab some, oh my gosh, you know what? I'm using like almost all granulating colors here. I'm gonna grab some of the Gothite, which is a little bit warmer. You know, the sizing seems to have held up just fine on this paper. I'm very pleased with that. You know, when you're working with the colors that you do want to get that granulating effect with, you want to um, make sure that you work a nice wet and wet layer and you let things dry. You let things dry naturally so they're not, um, so they're not, you know, you have a chance for things to settle out of the washes and you have a chance for the the paper to do its thing and plus you want to have some kind of um, someone let's see I want a Mars Brown let's do some of this Mars Brown so pretty um, and you want to have if you do want to do some scraping techniques you want to be able to be to work back in and the paper needs to be wet for you to scrape back in and I'll show you some techniques for that in just a second. I'm hoping that I don't get blossoms into the water. I am kind of pushing my luck a little bit, but I find that making rocks in that way is really, really fun. Okay, so to do the rocks that way, you just kind of grab your little credit card scraper and you just start, you can start scraping squeegeeing you can draw and any of those lines that you make the paint's going to settle in more and you're going to get more of that effect I have several scrapers and I'll just grab different ones for when I want different widths and different effects And you'll get different, um, you'll get different bleaching, bleaching effects and different um, wipeout effects depending 
on how dry it is when you go in and and uh, and scrape it out. If it's really wet, you're gonna get more of like a scrape and scratch in in the scribing of the paper. If it's wetter, you're gonna get more of a um, you need more of like a complete squeegee. If it's water, you're gonna get more of a scrape and a deep line. If you if it's drier, you're gonna get more of a squeegee. And if it's completely dry, you're not gonna get much. Um, so now I want to go in with my small, my half inch flat. I go with that darker color. We'll throw in some some little shadows. I believe this is uh, I think this is a Turner Mars Black. So very affordable. You know, you can always look at the more affordable paint ranges, the paint companies, and then look for the pigments that you want like maybe there's like a, a color you really have your eye on but they don't sell it in your country or it's very expensive you know see what pigments it's made out of and try some other brands and see if you can find that same pigment in some other in some other options from some other companies and see if you can get a better like a better price that way you may have I may have a weaker pigment strength there might be a reason why that that first brand that you were looking at cost that much more um, and sometimes it isn't. Sometimes it's just you're paying more for the brand. You're paying more because it has to be imported uh, from a certain country. You might just you might be just as happy with something from a different from a cheaper brand that might not be as popular. All right, so seems that any other little little highlights that I want to scrape. Scrape out. Sometimes if you've hit some like bleeding or blooming into the background, you can kind of scrape back and redefine some areas. All right, I don't want to mess up the pretty granulation that's happening, so I'm going to let this dry completely. And when we come back, we're going to add details and finish it up. But it looks to me like this paper has stood the test of time, even in my basement. So I am really, really happy about that. And the wetting of the back and the front of the paper at the same time is going to keep it nice and flat. So that's also a really good thing. I let this dry overnight just to make sure it was fully dry. And I'm really loving the texture here in these rocks. Um, I think I'm probably gonna leave this background the way it is and maybe add a little bit of rippling in the water there. So let's get to it. I think I'm gonna try to do most everything with these two brushes here, the reservoir liner and the uh, half inch angle brush. Um, I think let's start off in the water. Now we don't want to cover up too much because I like the texture that is that is happening there. I think I will use the flat brush for this. And um, I'm gonna take some cerulean and maybe add, let's see, what other colors did we use? Maybe add a little bit of that. Um, hmm. I don't know if I want to add anything too different in, but you know what, maybe a little bit of ultramarine blue. And maybe just put little bits of rippling here in the water, just to kind of give it a little bit of different uh, textures, a little bit of different um, movement maybe. Separate it from like the, the uniform texture of the sky. I'm using the bigger ripples towards the front. Getting a little bit smaller as we go back, just kind of stamping them on, you know. Very, very small, gentle strokes. Which 
try to keep it fairly consistent behind where the rock rock would be. You know, like if I've got some ripples over here, make sure they're about the same size on this side as well. You even stamp like this with a brush. Bigger shapes as we get closer to the rocks, smaller shapes further back, thinner shapes further back. Mm, maybe just some of the ultramarine more on its own. Ooh, that looks a little too too harsh. Just try to keep my brush somewhat um, parallel with a horizon line that we put in originally. And maybe pick up a little bit of this uh, purpley color I have on my palette from before. I don't clean my palette during the process of a painting, but I will clean it up when I'm done because I find it's false economy to try to save my paints um, from session to session just because I tend to, I don't, you know, I, I tend to, to switch my colors around a bit. I tend to use different colors. I use a limited palette for my paintings, but I don't use the same colors every time. Just want to push that back a little bit, give a little bit of definition between the front rocks and that. Uh, all right, I think, I think I'm pretty happy with the way that looks. I can always adjust it later. And now I'm going to I'm going to take some of that ultramarine blue since we did add that in. I want to have it in some other areas too. I think we used a little bit of this brown. Let's make some darks that way. Want to. Uh, Kind of sculpt a bit with the uh, with the paint. I will also be using that reservoir liner, but I just want to get some of these darker like facets in the rocks. Kind of pulled out with a flat brush here. At this point, I'll kind of go more by what I'm seeing on my on my paper as far as like nooks and crannies and shapes. And kind of abandon the reference photo a bit. Because I was just using that as a guide anyway, just as a kind of a jumping off point. Just to find some of these, to find some of these rocks. Don't want to lose, um, I don't want to lose the granulation that because that's a really nice texture for the rocks. I really want to make sure I keep that, but I also need a little bit of definition here and there. I don't know how this paper would scrub. I do have scrubbers that I could use if I want to. I might grab some of my M. Graham. My brown that's in the M. Graham line, I just find that it's re wets really well. That was some of the ultramarine blue. Yep, 
definitely changing the uh, the rock uh, shape to go with my scraping marks and the the other shapes that I have created or the paint has created for me. I think this does make the work of doing those interesting uh, random shapes kind of fun and easy. I think it also might be easy an easier liner if you have like a like a tremor or something. I think it would be easier to use something like this for lining versus a regular liner, which can be a little bit unwieldy to use. And I think I'll probably just keep making details on these rocks until I feel like I'm happy with the texture and definition of them. I think this might end up, this is a little bit more sandy over there. Any of your palette mud, anything you have left on your palette is fair game to use. Something I notice with the, your, your pigments that are more mineral based, more sedimentary and granulating is a lot of times they're a bit overbound, meaning they dry down a little bit harder and they, they can be tougher to rewet because of the amount of binder that's required to um, make them adhere to the paper and become paint. So rewetting them can be a little bit tricky. If you find that is a real big problem for you with your paints, you can always um, you can always just use them fresh from the tube and try to use them up as you uh, as you do your paintings. This reminds me of like painting with a with a pine needle or something. All right, I'm gonna switch switch brushes. I think it's kind of coming along all right. But I think I want to do more to the rocks. I like the texture in that sandy area, so I don't want to mess with that too much. Maybe I'll grab the dagger brush. That should, that might give me a different a different bit of shape. I feel like I would like some maybe purpley color. Um, let's do the ultramarine blue. I'm going to mix it in the dirty spot on my palette because I don't want it to be too bright because you know we've just started adding the ultramarine blue into the mix, and we also use some quinacridone. Rose, right? So I'm going to grab a little bit of that. Make a purple and we can always, it's easy to dull things down. It's hard to make them bright. So I'll just pick up some mud. All right. So my goal here, I want the rocks to be separated from the sand. Using this purple to kind of convey that bit of change in um, materials. It's also got a more transparent smooth quality to the paint so it should give me a smoother look to the rock and uh, make the sand feel a little bit more rough in comparison maybe or a little bit more textured or make the texture a little bit different in comparison I should say. I'm 
just giving these purples, purple hint to the rocks, which we don't see in the sand, essentially. Hope that makes sense. You know, you're working through a painting, you're figuring it out. Same thing, you know, I'm doing the same thing. I'm just kind of figuring it out as I go. Like, what's going to... The reference photo, like I said, I will link it up. Um, it doesn't have that much going on, and I really had to make up a lot of a lot of stuff to go with it, and I, I like that. I think that was really fun and challenging. Some Gothite, some Potter's Pink. Potter's Pink is one that can be really tough to rewet. My favorite Potter's Pink is... I, and I haven't used them all, but I really like... Um, the My Mary Blue Potter's Pink. That one rewets really well. Some of these areas are places where I left a bit of a gap because I didn't want my rocks to um, bleed into the water. So I'm going to go in and fill in a little bit. I haven't decided if I'm going to add any white to this or not. That looks so dark to me. I don't think I really like that patch. I'm going to use a scrubber to lift some of that up. These are Soft Scrubbers Royal and Land Nickel has these Soft Scrubber. They're Golden Taclon brushes and a few of their lines. Um, but I like it because they don't damage the paper, unlike the Stiff Scrubbers will. So if you're looking for something like that, you can find them in the Zen, the Nocturna Pro, and the Minta lines from Royal Land Nickel. I think that looks better. I think I will also try scrubbing up some highlights up here. Oh, I don't think it's going to be too effective actually. Uh, I wonder if I want to scrub out a little bit up there. I don't know. I kind of don't really want to. I don't want to do too much to the background, but then again, I've got a lot of blue that kind of scrubbed up. I think that maybe the scrubbing, actually it's working all right. I was thinking maybe the scrubbing wouldn't work so good on this paper being one that it's rough and two that it's old. And it's been stored in my basement, like in suboptimal conditions. And the cool thing about this, like doing that wetting the back and painting edge to edge is that you could definitely, um, you could definitely mount this on like a colored mat board and then mat it so you have like a little bit of a reveal and then you have that pretty deco edge. I think that would be really nice. You know, I think I do want to use a little bit of white in a palette knife. So I've got, um, I've got this bleed proof white right here. I just need to locate. Oh, you know what? I don't have to use a palette knife. I can use a credit card scraper. That will work fine and dandy. So let me grab a couple little, little credit card bits that I can use. Let's try that. I think that would be really nice. Actually, I think, I think a palette knife would actually work really well too, but I don't know. Do I have any little ones handy? Maybe I do. What do I got? Uh, I'm going to be able to use the corner of that one actually. So we've already done some scraping on this paper, so it's not that big of a deal, but I would just caution. Um, that, you know, when you do use a scraper on your paper, you are going to be damaging it a bit and just kind of proceed with caution. Uh, I think a credit card scraper is probably going to work a little bit easier. Maybe, maybe not. Mm, I don't know if I like that. Hmm. Looks like snow. I don't think I care for that. I don't. Let me, um, let's scrub that back and let me think on that again. I don't really like that. 
and it's bleed proof white so it is super opaque. You know what? Maybe like a pastel or something would work. That actually probably be a little bit better, like a pastel. Oh my goodness. Regrets. Well, hey, you know what? I regret nothing because you practice, you try stuff. Either it works out or it doesn't. And that's how the cookie crumbles, right? That's how that's how we learn. Let's do a little bit of Gothite and Potter's Pink. that we've used. That was a finicky potter's pink there. That one was Renaissance, I think. I do want a little more contrast there, so oh, maybe some color, but I think some color pencils is the way to go. All right, so we'll let that little area dry up a bit, and let's do let's do some colored pencil. Um, I don't know if I want a pure white because I think that might be a little bit too harsh, but. What's this? It's kind of like a soft gray. This is a gray green light. Let's give this a quick sharpen. Maybe just kind of hit some highlight areas. That's something I find sometimes using like a bright white is really kind of too harsh. But if you use something that's, you know, just a really light gray or a cream, that can work really well. Yeah, I feel like this is giving us a little bit of nice highlight and separation on some of these rocks. I don't feel like we need a ton. Just hit some of the edges there. Oh, I'm liking that. I think that's all right. I, I want to hit that with a dryer really quick because I think I'm going to go back in with that. Um, Maybe add a little bit of that, that highlight color up to the top, but go in with the, um, the Reservoir Quill and put a bit of, uh, put a bit more crinkle in there. Does that make sense? A little more crinkle? <laughs> you know what I mean. My paper's starting to warp a bit. I did, um, last night, I put a, uh, uh, heavy thing on top of this to flatten it out a bit, but it's starting to warp a bit, but I'm, I've actually had a request to do an, an ironing, how to iron a watercolor tutorial, so I think I'm going to do that with this when I'm done, and uh, I think that'll be good. So I'm going to use the Ultramarine Blue, and 
Oh, burnt umber. Again, I'm just kind of going and seeing where do I see these little fissures. any other little definitions that I need. The occlusion shadow where the uh, rocks touch the sand. I almost feel like I could have a little bit of uh, like a spattering down here. Maybe I'll do that too. Uh, grab a toothbrush. That's my favorite spattering tool. I feel like I have the best control. And what I like to do is just take something, make myself like a little stencil. Out of anything, I just literally will pull something out of my trash can and and use it because, I mean, why not? You're just gonna throw it away, right? It's just something that's gonna be tossed otherwise. I just tore a couple pieces. And if I get a little spattering on the, um, I'm just gonna take some gothite with my toothbrush here. If I do get a little spattering on the rocks, it's no big deal because you'd have that happen like with you'd have that with uh, with sand. Sand does that. If you find that you make a stencil you really like, you certainly can keep it and use it for other stuff. I don't feel like I need to do you know, a million things there. All right, so let's go back to that pencil, the, the light gray green. Let's put a little bit up there just to help it conform and match with the rest of that piece. If you feel like you need a little bit of dark, you could do you could do some dark pencil as well. Um, and then if you still feel like I just need a little bit a little bit of a boost and you need a little white somewhere, I would at that point maybe grab a white pencil and go in. The pencil is uh, pencil is going to be, you know, hard to remove. So I would try to be careful when you put that in, make sure that's what you want. Let me give that a real quick dry. I'm just debating whether I want to do something with pencil on the sand. Um, maybe with this like a uh, sandbar brown. Now, if I iron this, I'm definitely going to have to put like a piece of paper down. It might remove some of the pe color pencil, so I have to be careful about that. Um, but as long as I don't like move it around too much when I iron it, if I need to put the pencil back in afterwards, it should be fine. All right, I think I'll just do like a little bit. of shading here. Like I said, I don't want to cover up all of those beautiful colors that we've laid down with the... with the watercolor, but I do want it to feel like it's got that nice depth. I'm going to go in with... Um, this is a darker brown. This is called Sepia from Holbein right up in the inclusional shadow. I think I might even need to get a little bit darker than that. Work my way up to it though. Work my way up to using black and white because those are kind of like your most strong values so I would recommend keeping those to the last. And like this is a nice sharp one, sharp sharp black Prismacolor. I'll just go in and just kind of sneak it right in that occlusional shadow where, where I want that darkest value because that's where you'd have your darkest value would be right where 
right where an object touches another object. And they block out all of the light. So like I wouldn't go around, I probably wouldn't go around to the side, just kind of keep it in front where we are seeing the actual, the actual point of contact. Alright, and I think I'm going to call that done. Uh, I think it looks pretty nice, and it was a lot of fun to paint, and I'm so happy that this paper turned out to be okay. It wasn't, uh, I didn't just make a big sketchbook. Did I show you the sketchbook? I can't remember. I didn't just spend all this time making a sketchbook with paper that is going to be bad. Uh, well, at least half of this paper. Half of it is a new jobby 100% cotton, so I'm not sure about that, but the, uh, the Fabriano Uno uh, rough is good on this anyway. So thank you so much for watching. I'll probably have the ironing of this paper video up before this tutorial's up so you can look back in my videos on YouTube to find that. Thank you so much for watching. Please give me a thumbs up if you enjoy these real-time tutorials. Until next time, happy crafting. Bye!